almost four abreast with Salsa Bill coming to join them. Chimes of Freedom has got a lot to do. Salsa Bill over on the far rail has taken it up now. Dead Certain has dropped out of it and looks like being pulled up and Salsa Bill is striking now for the line and is going clear and doesn't look like being caught. Salsa Bill from Haunting Beauty has gone second, then comes London Pride. Chimes of Freedom can't get on terms at all and Salsa Bill wins this very convincingly. Shadaid on the near side, only yours, plugging on to the far side. Shadaid now beginning to quicken, being chased by the white-faced Chikarika. Shadaid going on now inside the final furlong. Silver Braids finishing well, but Shadaid has it well sewn up as they come to the line. It's going to be a third over the places, but Shadaid has won it well. The recent winners of the Fred Darling Stakes. It's always a marvellous trial for the 1,000 guineas. Five of today's runners are still entered in the big race. And Sheikh Hamdan's colours, we just saw carried successfully twice there, they'll be carried by Thawakib today. Well, hello and welcome to Newbury on Newbury, uh, well, the Newbury Spring Meeting. Always one of my favourite meetings of the year. And the spring flowers are in full bloom. There's a real spring feeling here with the first classic only 13 days away, the three roads are starting to blossom. It's been a bit of a hot and cold spring, and after six weeks of drought leading up to Cheltenham in March, there's been quite a bit of rain in the last 10 days. Did those Red Indian rainmakers really do the trick? Either way, the going today is officially good, good to soft in the back straight. The jockeys who rode in the first race, well, they described it as on the slow side. The Fred Darling is the focus of our three races today, sponsored again by Sheikh Maktoum's Gainsborough Stud. And the first prize is over £23,000. The supporting races are 240, the Newbury Racecourse Shopping Arcade rating handi Rated Handicap Stakes, a limited handicap with a £14 weight range. And then at 340, the Peter Smith Memorial Maiden Stakes, formerly the Spring Maiden Stakes, that's over a mile and three, and this is a race which has often thrown up a top-class horse in the past, not least the Derby winner, Quest for Fay. Well, there was quite a serious talking horse in the first race today, the Fairy King Colt Turtle Island, trained by Peter Chapel Hyam, and racing in the colours of Robert Sangster. He was a firm favourite at the Orc, this was how they bet. Turtle Island opened at six to four, returned at 13 to eight. Then it was 7-2, Kenneth Boy, who had experience. 9-2 from 5, Peter Rowley. 6-1, Zuno Star. 7-1, easy to back, Richard Hannon's bid for blue. 14-1, Baskerville. 20-1, Bar. Peter O'Sullivan describes the race. Zuno Star's in, uh, Turtle Island to go. That's it, they're all in and away. And a pretty good even break, too with the uh, passing player though just uh, a little bit slow and in the early stages towards the center of the course Peter Rowley Peter Rowley right up there with over on the far side bid for blue chasing them Baskerville Kennett Boy also up with the pace and Turtle Island getting closer, and Zuno Star towards the stand side. That's towards the left of the picture. Peter Rowley under pressure. And Kennett Boy just about the leader now. Kennett Boy from Turtle Island. Zuno Star coming there towards the near side. Baskerville in the center, coming down to the furlong pole. And uh, Turtle Island cantering at the moment with Baskerville on his outside. And Turtle Island going to win this very smoothly by the look of it. They've still got half a furlong to run, but Turtle Island looks to have this well sewn up as they race to the line. Turtle Island from Baskerville, passing players finishing well. But at the line, Turtle Island, the winner, passing player is second. Baskerville third and fourth with Zuno Star. Turtle Island, a very comfortable winner, the 13 to 8 favourite. Second number four, passing player at 20 to 1. Third number one, Baskerville at 14 to 1. The distances were five lengths and two lengths. The time was only 1 minute 07.68 seconds. That's slow, that's almost seven seconds slower than the standard. And that, I think, was a triumph of training with, for Peter Chapel High. And Peter, many congratulations. He really looks as though he knew the job. Yeah, he did. We haven't really done that much with him, but he's, he's done a couple of sharp bits and. Uh, He's a very quick learner, and he seemed to know what to do, and so we just thought we'd let him take his chance here, and obviously quite a few people backed him, by the looks of things. 
23,000 guineas yearling. He looks good at that value for that now. How yeah, highly do you rate him? I, I do think he's very good. Uh, he would want better ground than this. But uh, he went to Doncaster and was, uh, was unsold. He, be, he was for sale then, but he was brought back. Uh, but no, I, I think, I think he's, he could be a decent little horse. Have you got a programme in mind for him? I haven't at the moment, no, but uh, we'll just take him steadily along first and then uh, obviously find a, another small race like this. Then if he goes and wins that like he does, then we might have a crack at something like the Norfolk with him at Royal Ascot. Well, that must be an encouraging um, start for your two years this year. Yeah, well, he's obviously the first runner, so things are going well at the moment. But I do think my two olds are, are, are very good. I've been saying that before. Uh, they're the best bread bunch I've ever had. And they all seem, they all seem very sharp and know what to do. So hopefully we should have a good year with those. Well, I know last autumn you had misgivings about your three-year-olds for this year, but Chattleworth yesterday ran a terrific race. How's he come out of it? He, he lost eight kilos. He's, he seems in good form this morning. I saw the boys take him out for a walk this morning. And uh, no problems. He ate up last night and he had his breakfast this morning. Uh, he seems in great form. And I, but I, I'm not going to make a firm decision about the guineas yet till later on in the week. You've got another possibility in planetary aspect. Uh, he runs tomorrow. Yeah, he runs tomorrow. It's there's 22 runners. It's going to be a rough old race, I suppose. But he, he'd need to win if he was going to if he's going to be that good to take on Zephonic and those. But uh, he's he's in good form and working really well. Peter, what's the feeling in, at Manton this spring? Because last year you had a fantastic year. Rodriguez won you two classics and the champion. Dr. Devious won the derby. How do you handle the year after the year before? Well, you just keep going. You don't worry what's happened behind. You keep going looking forward. And uh, uh, probably we might never get another Dr. or Rodrigo again. But uh, we'll make the best of what we've got, definitely. There's a terrific sort of village feeling at Manton. Do you still have that great sort of esprit de corps there? Yeah, we do, yes. We've still got the cricket pitch. The <laughs> pub we've got everything still it still all goes on and everyone seems to get on with everyone i hope but no we all seem to get on along well it is it is like a village we just need a, a shop that's all and we'd be well away still got the pub there oh yes the pub's, <laughs> pub's still there I'm, I'm landlord so it stays open all hours <laughs> well turtle islands might buy a few rounds for this evening anyway well done thank you that's peter chapel highland uh, chapel Highland, rather i should say uh who has embarked very successfully on his uh, two-year-old program this year Oh, Tracy Pickett's with us again. Tracy, welcome back. I'm afraid you. you and I have shared something rather unpleasant since we last met at Liverpool. Yes, the flu, unfortunately. I think people are wondering what we were getting up to at Liverpool, but I'm recovering now, and you look well yourself, so I think we're over the worst. Well, I think we should explain we were in different hotels. Yes, of <laughs> course. All in the cause of art. Yeah. Now then, um, that despite uh, that regardless, your father seems indestructible. He's 57, older than both of us. Well, certainly older than you. <laughs> Um, and the, was in great form this week in the Craven State. Yes, he's had a marvellous week and uh, he's off to Ireland tomorrow. He's riding Fatherland, so that's going to give us a bit of a clearer picture, hopefully, for the classics. Uh, the horse was originally going to run at the Curra, but that uh, race uh, was abandoned, that, that meeting was abandoned. And then it was going to be the Tetrick at the Curra next Saturday, but it's going to be the 2000 Guineas trial tomorrow at Leopardstown. He's in great form and uh, he'll probably come to Newmarket because things have changed since in the last couple of weeks with uh, the Guineas picture. So Newmarket could be on the card, depending on how he runs tomorrow, and I think Vincent will make a decision next week sometime after the race. Would you regard him as the best of the Irish three-year-old Colts, or do you think Mr Bolger's might be superior? I think Jim Bolger has some very nice animals, but uh, I wouldn't like to say until we see him run again. He had a good season last year when he came to Newmarket and uh, finished behind Zephonic in the Dewhurst. I think he just had enough. He'd had a hard season, and uh, his conditions didn't really suit him. But I think we'll know a lot more after he's run tomorrow. Daddy's ridden him uh, a canter a couple of weeks ago at Valley Doyle, and he was very pleased with the way he's come on. He hasn't changed much over the winter, but uh, he seems satisfied with the way the horse has developed. And Bassam, of course, was the top rated of the Irish two years last year. He comes over for the uh, Greenham Stakes tomorrow. Um, Jim Bolger's, uh, are there good reports of him? Good reports, yes, mm -hmm. and I expect the horse to run well. Jim had two runners yesterday at Newmarket, and uh, they ran very well indeed. And um, his horses are in good form. And, and I hear that he's working very well at home, so I expect him to run a, a good race tomorrow. Well, Tracy, today's big race is the Fred Darling. Not quite as strong as in the last three years, but three nice fillies all the same. Suburg. Sawakib, not to mention Sekraj. How do you rate those three? I think they're hard names to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I was uh, studying it this morning and talking to various people since I've been here. I think oh. it's hard to oppose Subu. She's tough. She took on the Phillies last year in the Dewhurst, on the Colts, sorry, last year in the Dewhurst. 
and did it well. I think she ran a, a good race and, and she performed very well last year. Um, Clive Britton says that she's coming into herself. She, you know, it's a difficult time for Phillies and uh, I think I think she's probably the one that should win the race today. Tawa Keeb, I like very much. I think she's a very decent filly, but I think maybe she's more of an Oaks type of filly rather than uh, a Guineas filly. So I'm looking forward to seeing her next time. And um, I don't think Shama Sen is much of a slouch either. I've heard that she's a good filly, the other one of Clive Britton's. Mm. But between Sakraj and Subug, I think it's going to be a close thing, and I, I'm going to stick with Subug. Tracy, stick with us. Okay. We'll hear from Tracy throughout the afternoon, but now on to our first live race, which is the Newbury Shopping Arcade Rated Handicap Stakes. Six runners and riders, Peter O'Sullivan names them. Yes, it's sponsored by the five members of the brilliantly stocked uh, shopping arcade. And number one is Regal Chimes, written by Alan Munro. Two is Taha, written by Richard Quinn. Three, Plain Fact, Michael Hills. Four, All Through the Night, John Reed. Five, Inherent Magic, Willie Carson. And six, Oliphant's Fontaine, written by Gary Carter. Winners of 28 races between them, and here's how they bet. Well, we had joint favorites in the betting open. Tahars, though, is now the clear favorite on 9 to 4, and Regal Chimes has gone out from 5 to 2 to 11 to 4. Plain Fact is 4 to 1. Inherent Magic, 6 to 1. And 10 to 1 all through the night. That's uh, drifting considerably. It was uh, first of all 7 to 1, went to 9, so it's now 10 to 1, with Oliphantstein, 10 to 1. Well, the, as Julian was saying, we've had a fair bit of rain here, and the ground is sure to be riding very, very slow, as uh, the time told us in the first race. But there is Regal Chimes, number one, the Mount of Alla Monroe. Had an easy time last season, running only twice. Made his uh, one start this term, a winning one, when he made all to beat Silker Seeker by three parts of a length. That was in March over Doncaster's stiff six furlong. It was a bit of a shock that day, starting at 60 to one. But Alan Monroe showed some form yesterday at Newmarket when winning on Moonstrike. And both of them are in form, in fact, Regal Chimes and Alan Monroe. And uh, he's not going to be 60 to one today, John. There he'll be uh, around 11 to 4 at the moment. He'd be first or second favourite, I should think. Showed tremendous early speed, as you say. Possibly uh, like the faster ground there better than he'll like the good to soft or good ground here this afternoon. The first time was pretty slow. The ground is much slower than at Doncaster, and he's got to give weight away all right. Alan Monroe took him down to the start to the five furlong start in fact nice and slowly and there he's looking nice and collected on his way to the gate unlike uh, this one to Haas one of his main rivals is going down very free with Richard Quinn as you can see in fact he's favoured at two to one from nine to four and all the way down to the start he's taken a fair old grip he's a nice horse to Haas two seasons ago he won four races two of them here in fact at Newbury he drew a blank last term in 10 starts but it was always pretty high in the handicap he was paying for that season before on this his first run of the year he doesn't look on a bad mark however his best run last season was probably I would say at Sandown when three parts of a length second behind Oliver's Fontaine trying to give the winner 20 pounds so that was a good effort and uh, he doesn't seem too much wrong with him now John he's got him nicely settled Richard Quinn's giving him a pat down the neck he is a bit of an awkward ride I've heard in fact and when he's at home he, uh, he very seldom taken to the gallops in fact he's quite good he behaves himself quite well when he's uh, on like uh, cornfield stubble and things like that but as soon as he sees the grass he wants to get off with it he's two to one favorite now from nine to four Jimmy trained by Mikey Heaton Ellis formerly trained by Richard Hannon Mikey Heaton Ellis was with Richard Hannon before uh, setting up on his own. And Tahar's just a little bit warm and obviously not the easiest of rides, but Richard has him completely under control now. Just getting a, a little bit warm, however. He's, uh, I think he've, I've seen him swept before, before the start, John. And I don't think he's going to do too much damage today, do you? I don't think it'll make any difference, no. I don't know quite how freely he went uh, early on going down to the start well, uh, yeah, might have been uh, taken a little bit more out of him than is desirable but he's still clear favourite let's have a look at another one this is number three plain fact the mount of michael hills this eight-year-old has done well winning 12 of his 57 starts most of them however have been on fast ground 
He won four times last year. He ran a fair race, went third to Spaniards Close. That was in the autumn at Ascot. He was two and a half lengths off the winner on that occasion. But uh, I'd like to have seen the ground uh, ride in a little bit fast, faster for this colt by known fact. In fact, known facts are inclined to like the ground on the far side. Just might find it too slow here today. Okay. He did run a good race on the soft uh, when third at Ascot to Spaniards Close in that race you've just mentioned, Jimmy, third of 19, but you're quite right that the majority of his 12 wins have been when the ground's riding fast. He's been trained for most of his life by Sir Mark Prescott, but is now with John Hills, and let's see how he figures in the betting. And plain fact, four to one, but who knows what'll happen by the time of the last show. To Haas is the favorite, nine to four from twos, Regal Chime seven to two, plain fact four to one, five to one, and uh, it's coming a point to from sixes. Inherent Magic five to one. Inherent Magic all through the night, eight to one from tens. A bit of money there. And Oliphantine is sixteen to one. Let's have a look at number five, Amanda Willie Carson. And in fact, uh, this is just one. This filly, the only filly in the race, has just won the best turned out in the paddock, which. Uh, been beautifully turned out as well by Lisa Faltham. So, well done, Lisa. We don't quite know how much you've won, but if we can find out before the race is finished, we'll let you know. Five to one from six. Willie goes into stall five. Willie in great form once again this year, John. He's already amongst the winners, and this filly has been backed from six to one to five to one. She's a great favourite of Matt McCormack, who trains her. Very game little filly she's won three times and run very well in a lot of her other 15 races besides the three wins sure to give a good account of herself runners nice and settled down there that's uh Tahar's about to go into stall one there's a plain fact and then the blinkered Oli Fantas Fonti. Fontaine goes in stall six with the blinkers let's go to Peter that's it all in. And they're away. Oliver Spontine uh, towards the near side. Regal Chimes showing very good foot on the far side. So is Inherent Magic, and it's Regal Chimes, the leader from Inherent Magic. Taha right over on the far side, on the near side. Oliver Spontine just in behind them all through the night. And Inherent Magic and Willie Carson disputing it with the top one, Regal Chimes. Just in behind them all through the night. Tahar on the far side. Oliver Fontine towards the near side. Just the back marker at the moment is the old man, plain fact. Coming down towards the two furlong pole and over on the right of the picture, Regal Chimes. Nearest to us with the white face is uh, Inherent Magic. Oliver Fontine challenging all the time. And Regal Chimes with the advantage now as they come down towards the furlong pole. Regal Chimes from Oliver's Fontaine, then in between horses in here in Magic, but now Oliver's Fontaine has come to take it up on the near side. Oliver's Fontaine, the leader, as they race up towards the line from Regal Chimes over on the far side, then in here in Magic. And as they come to the line, Oliver's Fontaine has won it. It's very close for second, with in here in Magic just getting up to be second ahead of Regal Chimes with uh, fourth plain fact and so the result first number six Oliphant's Fontaine train owned by Mr. Trevor a painting train by Rod Simpson and ridden by Gary Carter that's got Rod off the uh, off the mark for the season second was number five inherent magic owned by Mrs. S.J. Stobel, trained by Matt McCormick and ridden by Willie Carson, and third, number one, Regal Chimes, owned by Mr. Michael Sturgis, trained by Brian McMahon and ridden by Alan Munro. Fourth was number three, Plain Fact. Not an easy one for the form students to pick out. This horse was 12 pounds out of the handicap. Regal Chimes has come to take it off Inherent Magic here and does seem to be travelling easily, easily enough here on the outside. Inherent Magic, nothing more to give. Tracking in behind them all through the night, seem to be travelling well enough here. And now Gary Card is just shaking the reins up on Oliphantine. Uh, Olif Oliphant Fontaine. And he picks up pretty well. Alan Monroe goes for his whip here and the response from Regal Chimes is a little bit disappointing. 
this horse is unquestionably better on top of the ground and the slow ground today seems to have slowed him down meanwhile Oliphant who's a son of Thatching handled the ground really well as you can see is quick and well from off the pace driven out by Gary Carter takes it up 150 yards from home increases his lead inside the final furlong to confound the handicapper and no doubt give Rod Simpson a few problems because the handicap is going to take into effect the fact that he's won quite comfortably from 12 pounds out of the handicap well I wouldn't think there'd be many punters uh, spending a fortune in the shopping arcade as a result of that result 16 to 1 uh, the winner but all credit to Rod Rod Simpson for getting off the mark for the season a real trier of a trainer Olivance Fontaine by Thatching out of Taplow, who was by Tap on Wood, winning the fifth race of his career in his 23rd race. And as Julian said, 12 pounds out of the handicap. Number eight of the season for Gary Carter. And the full starting prices and a couple of results from elsewhere. First number six, Oliphant's Fontaine, 16 to one. Second number five, Inherent Magic, 11 to two. And third number one, Regal Chimes, 100 to 30. There were six runners. First of all, a result from Thirsk, one of the meetings outside our own today. Uh, the uh, 2.15 at Thirsk went to number one, Ashcore, four to one. Second number six, Folly Vision, nine to two. And third number two, Sarangani Bay, Evans favorite, six ran. Air 2.30, first number one, Archie Brown, 11 to 10 on favorite. Second number eight, Mannery, two to one. And third number 10, Russian Castle, 100 to one. And our next race is the big one, the Games for a Stud Fred Darling Stakes. Well, this has been an important year for Newbury Racecourse with the opening of the new Berkshire Stand last <laughs> October and the launch of a major new program to take Newbury into the 21st century. Earlier today, Her Majesty the Queen took a personal look at the progress that Newbury has made over the last 12 months. Her Majesty arrived just before midday today to be greeted by the course chairman, Lord Carnarvon. Her Majesty prepared for spring winds, but in fact it's uh, a very pleasant spring day. And also welcomed there by the chief executive at Newbury, Major General David Pank. A new grandstand which was opened by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, last November and certainly the patrons are getting used to it now. Well, with me is the Chief Executive here at Newbury, Major General David Pang. Well Major, there has been a little bit of criticism in the early stages of the new stand, always the teething problems that you expect I suppose, but last November you had a baptism of fire on, on Hennessy Day and there were some problems weren't there? There are always problems on Hennessy Day. It's a big day for us. And I think some of the criticisms have become more muted as people have got used to the new facilities that we've got there. There was a certain amount of uninformed criticism, really stemming from two things. I think people have forgotten what was there in the first instance. And of course, the, uh, the facilities have improved enormously. Uh, for instance, there is about a 250% increase in the number of seats available in that stand, and something like a 40% increase in in the steppings. The members can still get to the same height as they used to under the old stand. And the second reason I think where criticism came was one of the first stands to be built following the Taylor Report and the Safety and Sports Crowns Act. And there are certain mandatory requirements there which the race girl wasn't really used to, such as the weight of the doors, which are, are quite strong, but they're designed to contain a fire for at least an hour. The height of the steppings was something which some of the people of shorter stature found difficult to cope with, but if you build them any higher than we built them there, you have to have crush barriers all the way along. However, I think the proof of the pudding perhaps is in the eating. 
And what was encouraging for us that last year, and the Berkshire stand was really only on stream for a quarter of it, was the fact that we increased our attendance here by over 14%, where I believe nationally racecourse attendance dropped by about 3%. We've had an unprecedented upsurge in applications for membership to the extent that we've had to put a ceiling on that, otherwise we're going to have too many. I met all my annual members, as I do twice a year, the last occasion at the turn of the year, and I had some very helpful and instructive comments from them. And as a result, we've given them a few more facilities to take account of the extra numbers that we're bringing in. I think it's fair to say that the main complaint last autumn was the usual one with the new grandstand. Too much space allocated to the private boxes and corporate entertaining areas. Not enough viewing space for the members and day members who've just got two fairly small areas on the second floor to watch the racing from. There and there on each side of the boxes. Yes, the one, uh, the first one he points to on the right there, that in fact is not even for members at all. That is for our Tattersall's race guys who really have not benefited at all as a result of uh, the Berkshire stand. They will, of course, get a, a marvellous facility when we move on to the second phase of our stand. You're quite right that on that floor there is something like room for about 500, but the steppings themselves and the seating area do provide greater facilities. One of the things that I'm hoping to do, and you see the staircases running down the front of the stand, the four of them there, I have an application in to the Secretary of State to have these removed if I possibly can. They take up a lot of room, they're beautifully designed litter traps, and there are occasions on big days when the race girl wants to stand on them and block the view of others. But that may take a few weeks yet. Mm -hmm. To go back to the private boxes, uh, the, the fact is that the bulk of the second, third and fourth floors, um, the second, third, fourth, they are all taken up by private boxes. Uh, that is to a certain extent true. On the second floor, there are six boxes, which are the principal boxes for our sponsors. I think you would agree, Julian, that racing needs sponsorship, whether you or I like it or not. And last year, as a result of the building which was going on here, we at Newbury concentrated our efforts on attracting new sponsorship to the race course. And the Berkshire Stand has been very helpful in doing that. And you'd be interested to know that we upped our sponsorship levels in the year of recession in 1992 over the previous year by £150,000 or 30%. We didn't actually target our race goers at all. And the extraordinary thing was our attendance went up there. And I don't think it's entirely out of pure curiosity of the new stand. Let's talk about the ground floor area, the Berkshire stand concourse. Very pleasant on a quiet day, but can it cope with the sort of crowd that you'll have tomorrow on Spring Cup Day? Yes, I'm confident that it can. We obviously used it on Hennessy Day, it was crowded. It's not unlike the festival at uh, Cheltenham when there is a certain amount of overcrowding. And it is our biggest day of the year uh, on Hennessy Day, and it was crowded, but people still managed to circulate and get access to the tote outlets and to the catering outlets. And what may interest you is that if we get an increase on attendance year on year of, say, 5%, there's an exponential growth in both tote turnover and catering turnover. They tend to go up by double that. And you've also got a new crash project. Yes, we have. Uh, the Rocking Horse Nursery, <laughs> which uh, is situated in the old weighing room. And uh, here we can cope with up to 36 children on a, on a race day. And it's proved very popular indeed. We do charge a small token sum for parents to leave their children there. But what we've done as a result of setting it up, and because of the enormous hurdles you have to overcome to set these things up from the local authority, we felt it was a waste to leave it empty on non-race days. And now we're into full-time childminding and we have the creche <laughs> open from Monday to Friday for the working wives of Newbury. Enough children there on race day. <laughs> um, David, very briefly, the charity race day on Friday, May the 14th. Yes, we're running our race day on that particular Friday, which is always an excellent day's racing. This year, all proceeds are going to Lambourne Racing Welfare. Mm. And I hope that as many people will come and contribute to the race day. It is their day and we're doing everything that we can to raise money for this really worthwhile charity. David, thank you for talking to us. <coughs> That's Major General David Pank, the Chief Executive here at Newbury, and, uh, well, teething problems are just, just there to be overcome. Now back to our first race this afternoon, which was the Newbury Shopping Arcade Rated Stakes. I'm pleased to welcome the winning trainer, Rod Simpson. Rod, congratulations. A winner of a Rated Stakes, 12 pounds out of the handicap. I know, I I've always fancied the horse because he's always been a very good horse, always been very fast. I mean, Five Furlong's good ground has always been his mark. 
It's just that we're not very many horses in training last year. I just overran him. I, I made him a bit sour. So we spent a lot of time at grass this winter and brought him back quite fresh. But I fell foul to this, uh, you know, the old alphabet game. And um, <laughs> I have a job reading, let alone being able to do the alphabet as well when I'm doing entries. But that's all that's happened here. I didn't read the small print, you know. And uh, so you didn't realise? No, I didn't realise until I'd made the entry. Anything. And once I'd made the entry, there wasn't anything else that I wanted to go for with the horse. So I just rang the owners and I said, look, I have booed with this entry, but the ground and the conditions will suit him. So we must, we mustn't, we must go. You know? Um, he's in at Sandown next uh, next week, and obviously he's won there, so we'll go there quite high on. Well, as a tra well, he certainly picked up really well here, and, and presumably this bit of ground um, just helped him today. Yes, he doesn't like it too soft. He's never been a he's never been a fluent move on a soft ground, and actually the, the nice thing about Gary here today is that he's managed to you know, get a lead from the others. I don't like this horse doing all the donkey work, and uh, he's done that in the past. And, and actually, as I said, I just made him a little bit of a sour horse last year. Um, but there he is, look, he's come good, come fresh. He's like his trainer. <laughs> well, turns up in the most unexpected <laughs> places. <laughs> I think I'd sooner ride a camel than I would Ollie Fontaine, Spontane, though. He's not the easiest of rides, actually. It's <laughs> very tricky. But he likes, uh, he likes sand, though, doesn't he? He likes a bit of uphill finish. And... I think, actually, drawing the other side might have been a lot different to this race. I think that uh, the ground this side is a lot easier. I think it rides better to stand side. So, Rod, I mean, as a trainer, you know, how easy has it been for you to come to terms with a new programme for competitive racing, which has revolutionised races like this, for, uh, for example, which in the olden days would have had a span of £35, and now it's a span of £14. Have you found it easy to come to terms with? No, I find it... I mean, I find uh, most of my entries are quite difficult to make for the simple reason that I, I have to do everything myself. I don't have a full-time secretary and uh, I work full-time in the yard as well as a, as a main lad. So, obviously, I don't get the opportunity to sit down and actually just bask on the fact of, well, all you've got to do today is just look at entries. And um, I, I see something I like. If my horse is right, then I want to make that entry. And, and uh, on this particular occasion, I just didn't wear the spectacles to look at the small print. <laughs> Well, but I'm hoping that the winner. handicapper now will just uh, be, play the game and take him off of the mark that he had, not the mark he's run off uh, today, because I think that would be sensible. I think any handicapper is going to be sensible. And I just saw a pig flying by. <laughs> Rod, Rod, congratulations. Rod's had plenty on his plate recently because he's just come out with a book called Mainly Fun and Horses. Another story by Rod Simpson. Now, what is a rating stakes? Obviously, it's caused problems for the trainers. It certainly caused a certain amount of unhappiness for the bookmakers. A rated stakes is part of the new program for competitive racing. And it's a handicap with a weight range of only 10 or 14 pounds, which takes the place of, as I say, handicaps, which in the olden days would have had a weight range of 35 pounds. The purpose of it is to give a chance to the better type of horse, like Sir Harry Hardman, who won at Haydock last weekend, so that they've only got a maximum £14 concession. However, the difficulty comes that there are a number of horses out of the handicap, unpredictably, and uh, trainers like Rod Simpson, who aren't prepared to grasp hold of the nettle, are uh, inclined to say, well, I don't want to race from out of the handicap. That is to race from off a mark higher than the jockey club rating indicates or intends. And so the fields for these rating stakes have been much smaller than the comparable handicaps 12 months ago. With me is the man who devised the scheme. He's David Oldry. David, what's your reaction to the first weeks of rated stakes? I think that uh, you know, given that we're only just beginning, not bad at all. Certainly, uh, over the next few months, as people get more familiar, there will be more runners, in my view. It's important that there are. I mean, I think one devised the system, the development group devised the system with the view of getting eight or ten runners, something of that sort. To get six is too small, but uh, hopefully it'll build up as people begin to understand what opportunities there are. The bookies are obviously unhappy that you should have a field of six here, there have been fields of seven and eight. Well, Yes, I don't, one, I, I'm unhappy if you have too many fields of six, certainly. Um, eight, nine, ten, perfectly all right in my view. Also, I think one's got to take account of the fact that all the races that have disappeared to allow these rated stakes to take place were not, in fact, handicaps. You know, some 30 of them were maiden races, even sellers, um, all sorts of odd uh, non-handicap races. So it's not by any means a straight swap and can't be looked at in that light. But the concept was to give a better chance to the better class of handicapper. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, a really a nice class of horse who falls below the pattern 
and yet is so heavily weighted in these £35 handicaps that really the only thing to do is sell him off abroad, which I'm afraid has happened all too often. And far better, you know, give him an opportunity, give him something to run in here, keep them here. I mean, they are really good horses. So very briefly, your message is give it time to settle down. Absolutely. Thank you very much. That's uh, Mr. David Oldry, a steward of the Jockey Club. Just about ten minutes now to go to our big race of the day, the gains for a stud, Fred Darling Stakes, uh, the last major trial for the 1,000 guineas. We'll be back in plenty of time for that, but before then, we return to London for the news at three o'clock with Maurice Gill. <laughs> Good afternoon. The United Nations is gearing up for a mass rescue of up to 30,000 Muslim refugees from the besieged Bosnian town of Srebrenica. The town has been under heavy shelling and it's expected to fall to the Serbs at any time. British Sea King helicopters are standing by to rescue the 500 injured in Srebrenica hospital. So are 75 trucks at UNHCR in Belgrade and Zagreb. But exactly when they'll be needed depends on the weather, the ceasefire and the Serbs. Lord Owen, meanwhile, has joined the debate about military intervention. He says if the fighting continues, the West must intervene. That means interfering by means of air attack on bridges and roads in Bosnia-Herzegovina that are carrying the oil and the fuel and the spare parts and the ammunition on which this war is still depending. It may come as no comfort to the besieged people of Srebrenica, but the Serb leader Radovan Karadic has this afternoon been quoted as saying that his forces don't want to enter the town, they just want to pacify it. Road traffic has remained light today despite the second national rail strike in a fortnight. Trains throughout the country have been at a standstill as the unions protest about working conditions and possible job losses. The AA says there are no major jams, many people have simply chosen to stay at home. Another prisoner under the supervision of Group 4 has escaped from custody. The latest incident happened in Sheffield. Since the company began prison escort duties last week, five people have escaped and two were set free by mistake. Yesterday, the company was told to improve its services by the head of the prison service. The four British climbers who went missing during a climbing trip in southern Russia have arrived in Moscow. They're said to be in good health, although shaken by their ordeal. A plane brought the four exhausted climbers back to Moscow, where they'll try to get some rest tonight before returning home. They're expected to give more details later about their remarkable story of survival, how they trekked for up to 20 miles through waist-deep snow, staying alive for five days in sub-zero temperatures with only a few bars of chocolate to keep them going. The four were taken to the British Embassy in Moscow, where they'll be able to eat and rest properly. They're looking astonishingly fit after their ordeal. None of them is suffering from frostbite. Inflation has increased slightly, with prices rising in the year to March by 1.9%. The main factor behind the increase was a bigger-than-expected rise in seasonal food prices. Economists are expecting a fall in next month's figures. And that's it for now. More news at 10 to 4. A very good afternoon to you. We're all going to see some rain, I think, in the next 18 hours. It's already gathering itself in western Scotland, down through to the Isle of Man, and a little bit across, as you can see, in northeastern parts of England. That's going to come southwards by the end of the afternoon, further down into northern England, down into uh, North Wales, on the western side of Wales, too, and making the sunshine over in central and southeastern parts much more hazy. The rain then getting down into the uh, south, I think, uh, during the night. Clearer weather tucking in behind. Colder weather too, perhaps a touch of frost in the glens of Scotland, but pretty mild, as you can see, down in the south. A lot of clouds, some rain then in the south. That's going to clear away by and large in the morning, but down in southwest England, the Channel Islands, keeping it rather cloudy, and most of the showers tomorrow in the far north. That's it from me. Bye.
Get set for summer with BBC Sports. And the sport here on two is racing. And it's time now to return to Julian Wilson at Newbury. Welcome back. They're just on the way to post for the games for a stud. Fred Darling stakes, a field of seven. Five of them are engaged in the 1,000 guineas. Peter S. Sullivan names the field. And uh, headed by the only unbeaten filly in the field, Terry Wogan's Gov's Joy, written by Pat Eddery. Two is Holly Golightly, John Reed. Three, Ribbon Wood, Michael Roberts. Four, Sacrage, Daryl Holland. Five, Shamasen, Frankie de Torre. Six, Subug, Walter Swinburne. Seven, Thawakib, written by Willie Carson. Here's how they bet. And a fair bit of movement in the betting. Subug is the joint favourite on nine to four with Sikraj. Thawakib, three to one. It's not far away from that. Ribbonwood is ten to one. Holly Golightly, 14s, and there is interest there. Opened at 20s, went to 16, is now 14 to 1. Holly Golightly. Shamaskan, 25 to 1, and Govs Joy, the same price. And here is the joint favourite, Subug, the second of these two. The defeat of Sayadati was a big disappointment for Clive Britton on Tuesday, no doubt about that, but uh, she was far from disgrace. And this filly's rated a few pounds behind Sayadati, but She's highly regarded nonetheless, and she certainly caught no one unawares when she won here last September. Nicktarina's got a lot to do. Being shaken up is Singer on the roof. But in the centre, Sue Boog has taken it up now under Frankie de Torre. Sue Boog, the leader in the centre from Welsh Heritage. Then coming there strongly is Santara with Singer on the roof. But it's Sue Boog as they come down to the furlong pole. Santara has gone second. Then in third is Welsh Heritage. Making ground just in behind them is uh, Princess Tatium. But as they come to the line, Sue Boog has this sewn up from Santara. Sue Boog the winner, Santara is second and just getting up in a photo, very, very close indeed, Susquehanna Days and Boweth. Frankie de Torre was the jockey that day, Subu went on to finish fourth in the Dewhurst, Tracy Pickett uh, is she ready to win today? Looking at her in the paddock and watching her going down, I, I think she is, she's a lovely filly, she's tough and genuine and she, she gives it her all, she's moving well down there, Clive Britton was saying that she, she is fit he said, uh, you know, she would be coming in her coat in a couple of weeks. She's not quite right yet. But as we've said, you know, this time of year, the weather is so unpredictable <coughs> with fillies. But she looks very, very well. And uh, I think she's going to be the one they'll have to beat today. Well, Sheikh Hamdan won this race in 1990 and 1991. We saw those two successes earlier in the program. Today, his runner is Thawakib, who's just had a little bit of a setback. But here she is. Tracy, what about her? Well, she's a beautifully bred filly. Uh, I was talking to Willie before the first race, and he just feels that she needs a bit further than this distance today, and uh, he'd prefer it more as, as an Oaks type of a filly. Um, I was reading this morning, as you said, John Dunlop said that she's had a bit of a muscle problem with her shoulder. Um, Willie didn't seem to think there was a problem there, but I think she's a lovely filly, but I think uh, today could be Subud's day. Very good. Let's join Jimmy and John. Thanks, Julian. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, that is number seven, Thakaweeb with uh, Willie Carson in the saddle. Willie in great form. This filly had a little bit of trouble with her off shoulder this spring, so she's a little bit behind schedule, but she's going to be a nice filly. And as uh, they were saying, that uh, perhaps she could be more of an Oaks filly than a Guinness. Let's have a look at number four now. Sakraj. This uh, filly was a very good filly when trained in Italy last season. She's now joined Roger Charlton at Beckhampton. And earlier on, Julian spoke to Roger. Roger, how did you come to acquire this filly? Um, Peter Ragg, um, who looks after one of my owners, Dr. Carlos Stelling, bought the filly um, in the autumn after she'd run well during last year. And she arrived in my yard in the middle of November. Have you been able to give her the sort of preparation you want? Yes, I mean, she, she arrived having run eight times last year. Uh, her last race was on the 1st of November when she won a listed race by five and a half lengths in Italy. Um, looking marvellous when she came. She settled in very quickly. She's a um, small filly. She's only just over 15 hands. She's very strong. And um, she's been behaving, you know, very well. She seemed to show her best form and there was a bit of cut in the ground as a T-Rod. Yes, I think 
she she's very happy when there's a cut in the ground. Having said that, I think every time she actually ran, by chance it was soft or heavy. Um, we haven't yet had an opportunity to run her on, on good or fast ground. Do you regard her as a genuine 1,000 guineas prospect? Um, well, we'll see after today. I, the, the, the brief really is to run her in the Fred Darling, which is normally run on good or soft ground. Um, okay. See how it goes from there. She's in the Italian 1,000 guineas, which is in about eight or nine days' time. And unless she ran very well here, she, that's really her target. Now, if she happened to perform <laughs> extremely well here, then there's obviously a chance that she could run in the English guineas or the Irish guineas or, or the French guineas. We'll have to see. Lovely. Perfect. Well, she... Looks very well in a coach. She looks like she's come to hand. She's uh, a nine to four favorite. Young Darrell Holland in the saddle. Darrell looking for his 10th winner of the season. But I think, John, the best race uh, that she probably ran was in the Mornay at Deauville, when uh, just beaten three parts of a length by Saphonic. But it was heavy that day, wasn't it? It was, uh, but it was a very good run. She looks extremely well. She's a lot uh, brighter in her coat than many of the fillies here this afternoon. And she's come in for plenty of support. Roger Charlton started off with a very easy winner at Warwick earlier in the week, three-year-old maiden. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see this filly win here. If we can find number six, Subug. And uh, there she is. She's a nice filly. She's only run twice. Went, won a debut here. That was in September. And then ran a good race. She was put in the deep end at, uh, in the Dewhurst Stake when she finished fourth to Saphonic, John, which was a good run. Very good run for an inexperienced filly. She was uh, only half a length or so behind the second horse that day, though Zephonic did win very easily. This is Ribbon Wood. She hasn't really come in her coat yet. Just getting a little bit warm in the paddock. She was very impressive here last autumn. They're all in. Here's Peter O'Sullivan. That's it. Sakraj nearest to us. Holly Golightly breaks fast. So does Shamisen. Shamisen and uh, Holly Golightly disputing it up front, but very closely packed, and now Thawakib goes on. Thawakib takes it up from Shamisen on the inside of Holligood Lightly. Subug is four and five is Sakraj. Then comes Gov's Joy, and the back marker is Ribbonwood as they race towards the home turn, with Thawakib the leader from Holligood Lightly and Shamisen and Subug, and then Sakraj, Gov's Joy, and Ribbonwood. Into the straight now. Just uh, four and a half furlongs to run in the Gainsborough start, Fred Darling. And over on the far side, it's Thawakib. Thawakib from uh, Sekraj going well now in second. And then Subu traveling well just in behind them. Holly Golightly has gone very wide of the remainder, coming down towards the three furlong pole. Sekraj, Th Thawakib, and behind them, Shamis Sen, and then Subu and Gov's Joy coming down towards the two furlong pole. Sekraj with the advantage now. Sekraj from Subu improving towards the stand side. Thawakib battling on over on the far side. Th Subu comes to tackle Sekraj now and Ribbonwood coming there from the rear as they come to the furlong pole. Subu in the center over on the far side. Sekraj, Ribbonwood still making ground but Subu has taken it up now as they enter the final furlong and Subu racing up towards the line is going to win the Fred Darling as they come to the line. Subu wins it neatly at the line. Subu the winner. It's close for second between Ribbonwood who just gets up to be second ahead of Sek head of Sekraj with Thawakib four five Shamisen, six Gov's Joy and seven Holly Golightly and so the result of the Gainsborough start Fred Darling is first number six Subug owned by Mr. Mohammed Obaida trained by Clive Britton and written by Walter Swinburne. Second was number three, Ribbon Wood, owned by Sheikh Mohammed, trained by John Gosden, and written by Michael Roberts. And third, number four, Sekraj, owned by Dr. Carlos E. Stelling, trained by Roger Charlton, and written by Darrell Holland, with fourth, number seven, Thawakib. Darrell Holland went for home pretty early on Sekraj. Up until this point, that's how Waqib had led, but uh, on sufferance, didn't find a great deal when Willie Carson asked her to quicken, and Sekraj quickly goed, went into a two-length lead at the two-furlong marker. 
but with the ground riding slow like this and the uphill finish it's a long way home and Walter Swinburne has worked himself into a position of challenge below the distance and now Darrell Holland is throwing out all sorts of distress signals as Subu sweeps into the lead at the furlong quickly goes a length and a half clear and Sekraj doesn't get home whether she needed the race or whether this is testing her stamina to the limit in the end she gets caught by Cottonwood for second place but Subu without producing any brilliant acceleration has galloped her way to the front and has drawn away in the last furlong to go three perhaps three and a half lengths clear although cottonwood finishing well in the end but this is good consolation for clive britain for the defeat of sir darty and he's always spoken well of this filly subo the winner ribbonwood is second uh, walter swinburne continuing his Excellent sequence in this race. He won it in 1985 on May Soon in 1986 on Top Socialite. And Subug, the 5-2 to two winner. She pays quite a compliment to Zephonic in the process. She was uh, fourth, beaten over four lengths by Zephonic in the Dewhurst. And as Julian said, nice consolation to for Clyde Britton for the defeat of Sayer Darty earlier in the week. Subug by Darshan out of Nordica by North Fields. She's engaged in both the 1,000 guineas and the Oaks. Hills quota 10 to 1 for the 1,000 guineas and corals go 8 to 1 with the Andre Farb trained uh, filly Elizabeth Bay, most uh, bookmakers favorite for the first filly's class at the Newmarket. And I expect we'll find uh, Sekraj going for the Italian 1000. Clive there, dark suited with uh, Walter Swinburne. That's Clive's sixth winner of the season. Number four for Walter Swinburne. This filly a good winner on her debut before finishing uh, fourth in the Dewhurst Stakes. Joe Mercer there, manager for the owner, who's been in this winner's circle very often himself. Number four. So with uh, Subu, the winner, the full starting price is as follows. First, number six, Subu, five to two. Second, number three, Ribbonwood, ten to one. And yeah, third, number four, Sakraj, two to one favorite. Now, seven runners. Result from Thirsk, that's the 250. First number seven, Parkside Lady, nine to one. Second number two, Palace Gate Joe, two to one favorite. And third number five, Batten's River, three to one. Seven runners there also. Air of the three o'clock, first number one, last of the bunch, five to four on, a favorite. Second number two, Carversdale, 11 to two. And third number four, Interim Lib, seven to two. There were four runners. I hope to speak to Clive Breton and Walter Swinburne shortly, but one first reaction is that that uh, certainly enhances the form of the Dewhurst Stakes, won so easily by Zephonic last autumn. Zephonic, of course, even money favourite with the 2,000 guineas now. The second and third in the Dewhurst both run in the Greenham Stakes tomorrow. They are firm pledge and inch and all. We'll uh, await their reappearance with interest. Well, Jimmy Lindy was watching that race with me, and Jimmy, a straightforward race in the end and an impressive winner. It was, Julian, yes. I think uh, Sir Kraj got there a little bit too soon with Darrow. I think Darrow would have liked to have been there, perhaps showing the front about a furlong out. He got there nearly three out. 
but uh, as you say, Subu was always travelling well with young Walter and uh, probably a, a really good workmanlike performance. I think she's a tough filly and as you say, that Dewhurst form's working out pretty good now and uh, I thought Clive was very brave of running her against the Colts that day after only one run when winning a maiden here. So she had a pretty tough task on her hands at Newmarket. Well, let's look at this from the outset and they've gone off at a fairly even pace. Ribbonwood, the last to be installed and off they go. Yes, as you see there, you can see uh, Walter's quite content to sit well up with the pace there. And he's just got this filly, he's just got her head turned a little bit to the left, as you can see. So he's taken a little bit time to settle her. But uh, then they've shifted on a bit, and Willie Carson with Thakoeeb has gone and chose to make it. But I don't think sort of Willie had too much. He, he, this filly would have fought hard with him if he'd have tried to have kept her back behind. But um, then we can go back to Daryl Holland, in fact. Uh, Daryl's biding his time on Sacrege there. And this is where I think he would have liked to have stopped uh, all the time Willie's made a pace now and he's got Thakweb, Thakaib uh, nicely sort of settled in the front although for the first three or four she was pulling hard with him and then Daryl suddenly got a bit of a split and uh, she sort of pulled her way to the front there and as you see and it's a long way to be in front up here at uh, Newbury especially on this dead ground and Walter as you can see behind has got a good lead now and he let this filly really settle with him he's just riding her on a nice long rein and he's letting her go. Interesting to see Ribbonwood along. drop out almost last there before she picks up. Yeah Ribbonwood she, she hasn't had all that uh, much experience yet and Michael Roberts I think was going to be a little bit easier on, on her today and give her a nice uh, impression of racing and then in the end uh, the uh, second filly the, well, the filly that's running there on the rail now with Daryl Holland, she began to tie up and then could let Ribbonwood back into the races. But let's go with Walter and the winner now. He's just picked uh, Sue Boog up and she's gone to the front nicely and she's got about a neck, three parts of a length up here. And young Walter's just allowed to keep her running now on this soft ground. I think she handles it well because uh, when she won a maiden here, she, uh, she she was a little bit on the dead side. But the other filly with Daryl Holland's just tying up and Ribbonwood's just run home in second place. But a good effort and I think a pretty, pretty class filly, Julian. Yeah. Well, a good performance. Nice consolation, of course, for the owner, who's Sarah Darty was beaten on Tuesday. Let's go down to the unsaddling enclosure now and join the presentation scene. John Hammer describes it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the, the presentation will be made by Mrs. Michael Goodbody, the wife of the general manager of the sponsors, Gainsborough Stud, and receiving will be Joe Mercer on behalf of the winning owner. There's Joe Mercer, who, as Peter O'Sullivan said, has been in the winner's enclosure at Newbury on many, many occasions. And there's Joe being congratulated by Mrs. Michael Goodbody and being presented with the challenge trophy for the winning owner to be held until 1994. But uh, if the winning owner did happen to win three successive runnings, then he would retain the trophy for life. So keeping it in the family, so to speak, and I'm now pleased to welcome the winning team, Walter Swinburne and Clive Britton. Walter, first of all, congratulations. Um, tell us how the race went. Oh, it went really, really well, actually. Um, they went out, offered a nice pace out of the gates and enabled me to settle her in quickly. And then after that, um, Daryl came up on my inside and you know, went to the front about three and a half out and I was able to get tucked in behind him and, and get a good lead. And Daryl, as you say, went for home at the two and you followed him through and from now on you must have always felt you were in a winning position. I did, yes. I mean, your Clive's got her in really good shape. She's fit and well, she loves the ground and she stays, so I knew I'd get to the winning post. <laughs> The ground riding on the slow side today? Very much so. Uh, cantering down, it actually doesn't give you too bad a feel, but coming back, going a bit quicker, it's, it's very dead. And how far is she going to stay? Well, we've all been a bit of a... always felt she was going to stay. Um, but I suppose after today, I'm really even more convinced that she will. You know, I think a mile and a quarter plus is her, her best. Well, she's the daughter of Darshan. Um, the ground certainly suited her, but... Uh, She's really used her action well there. Uh, and Clive, you must be delighted with her. Yes, and it uh, also sort of finishes up the uh, the week. I, you know, a big disappointment with Saadati, obviously. But things have come to light there. The filly's blood wasn't uh, 100%. We had it checked yesterday evening. And um, the levels are upside down. So obviously she, she ran a flat race um, 
hoping that she won't be uh, inconvenienced over the next week and uh, we'll go back for the guineas and they've still got us to beat. Well, the, the two fillies are owned by the same owner. Will you run them both at Newmarket now? No, very unlikely that... Uh, um, I haven't spoken to him, but very unlikely that uh, both would run. Um, the outside chance uh, would have been if it was a bog at Longchamp because it would have been uh, a test of stamina. We could go for the... Um, French 1000, but she's in the Oaks, and that must be our thinking now. Suburg for, for the mm -hmm. Oaks, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, Darty, are you, are you happy that her blood will come right in time? You've only got 13 days. Well, we led her out for a couple of days, and uh, I had to have her ridden this morning because she was squealing and kicking. I thought I had more risk of seeing blood on the floor with her <laughs> falling on her back or something than uh, the blood inside her. But uh, she was ridden around, she had a squeal in the buck. Uh, I don't think there was too much. I mean, uh, to me, the loss of 14 kilos uh, means that they've run under some sort of stress. She never showed it uh, travelling up to the race course. She never showed it in the parade ring, and she certainly didn't show it cantering the post. The only time she showed it was when she came under pressure, or at a pressure point, and thank God the water didn't put her under any pressure, and she wasn't going to zip like we know she can zip. So, uh, say, Daddy ran without the zip, you know. So, Walter, where do you stand? Will you definitely stick with Sayadati? Because you could, of course, ride as Zari Sidiana. Let's just start looking in. <laughs> <laughs> they get cold feet. <laughs> I never do. No, that's not an answer. Well, 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 thank you. Well, you know what a good judge I am with fillies. Um, no, I'm, I'm a big Sayadati fan, and um, I totally endorse everything that Clive said, and she didn't fire at all, and I definitely want to ride her. Well, that's it. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. So, one of the last pieces of the 1,000 guineas uh, jigsaw fits into place. Of course, there's one wild card, that's Lyric Fantasy, who hasn't run in one of the trials, but all the other fillies have run in the trials. Zophonic now looks an assured favourite for the 2,000 guineas, and particularly after this race we've just seen. So what about the Derby? The Derby is the one race where perhaps there's a little bit of value left in the anti-post market. Well, we've isolated three horses who we feel have got a real chance of turning up on the day with a winning chance. And the first of them is Tenby, who's always been my number one Derby horse, well, ever since he won the Washington Singer Stakes in great style here last August. As they move down towards the two furlong marker, Tenby pressed by right win and two of them drawing two or three lengths clear from civil law inside the two and Pat Edry asking this colt to race now. John Reed goes for his whip on right win. Tenby coming to the furlong marker with a lead of a length, length and a half. Hasn't been asked a serious question by Pat Edry and Tenby going clear, going three, four lengths clear now from right win. This is the real thing. Tenby going five, six lengths clear. This looks like a real racehorse. Tenby winning with his head in his chest. Tenby wins the Washington Singer. Right wins second. Civil Law is back in third place and trailing in a distant fourth is Reed or said. Tracy, I love that little horse. Do you like him? I like him very much, yes. I wish I was Khaled Abdullah. He's got two very good colts and uh, I think Tenby is a derby type of a horse. He's compact and he, he acts very well on that type of uh, I think he'll act very well on that type of a course. It's early days yet. I'd like to see him run again, of course, but uh, I think he's, he's a very genuine, good tough sort of horse and the horse that uh, is going to be the, the horse that one would like to see for a derby. So at this point, you prefer him to Armager? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, think, I think they're two completely different horses. I think Armager, he's, he's a bigger, he's more of a galloping type of a horse, and I'd be worried as to whether he would act on uh, on, Eps on the Epsom track. Um, if it was soft, yes, I think he'd have a very, very good chance. I'd just be worried if the ground came up fast. Right. Well, Tenby reappears in the Thresher Classic trial at Sandown next Saturday week. Now, what about John Gosden? He won the Craven Stakes yesterday with Emperor Jones, but there's no doubt that his number one derby horse is Teos. As they race towards the home turn now, from Village Green in second, third is Star Manager, four Euroling Thunder, then comes Teos beginning a little bit of a run. Brandon Hurst over on the far side. McCamadoff in rear as they turn into the straight. Three furlongs to run now. And Ibiza still the leader from Village Green. Star manager. 
declassified towards the outside. Tail still trying to get into top gear. Racing towards the furlong pole. Declassified. The first challenger to Evisa. Evisa from declassified. Tail still making a run from the rear. Evisa and declassified. And here comes Tails under Steve Gordon to take it up in the second colours. And racing up towards the line now. Tails has gone clear as they run to the wire. It's going to be a comfortable victory for Tails at the line. Tails is the winner. It's a photo for second between declassified Makamadov and on the far side Evita. Tracy, he's unbeaten in three runs and he's got all the hallmarks of a stare, hasn't he? Yes, I think he has, and he's a horse on the upgrade. I see that John Gosden's setting him straight for the to the Dante, so it'll be interesting to see how he runs there. But I think with some of the others that we've we've looked at and talked about, he might have a little bit to find. John Gosden horses, of course, are in, are in great form, and uh, I think he's he he's got a chance in the race. You know, he's not he's not a horse that shouldn't be running in the race. But um, I just like to see him run again before I make up my mind. Well, as you say, he reappears in the Tote Dante Stakes at York on May the 12th, and that's also the race in which Armitage makes his seasonal reappearance. Well, now horse number three, and he's another Saddler's Wells horse like Teos we've just seen, and a horse that some people may have forgotten, Desert Secret, the horse who won the Royal Lodge Stakes at the Festival of Racing. They're all very tightly bunched as they hit the straight two and a half furlongs out. And Scottish Peak, the leader, from Guy's Way improving. Then on the outside, York Hill and Perfect Imposter on the inside, Desert Secret, as they come to the final furlong. And Guy's Way, the leader, Needle Gun putting down a challenge on the outside. King Paris coming late, Lost Soldiers coming late. And Desert Secret on the inside, but it's Guy's Way, the leader, from Lost Soldier and Desert Secret and Needle Gun as they run up to the line, Lester Pickett on Guy's Way, challenged by Pat Edry on Desert Secret as they run up to the line. Desert Secret just gets up to beat Guy's Way, Lost Soldier third, and Needle Gun is fourth. Pat Edry just getting up to beat your father there. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Progressive, lazy sort of horse, but uh, oh. you feel he could make the grade, Desert Secret? I'm not that mad about the horse. Um, I was talking to my father actually about that race last night, and, and he felt it wasn't a particularly good Royal Lodge, that this horse would have a little bit to find. But uh, again, we have to wait and see. It's a difficult time of year. There's a lot of guessing going on. Of course, he got beat later on in the Racing Post Trophy, but the ground was soft that yes, day. Yes, And I think better ground would suit him. Yes, I think he's, he's a better ground type of a horse. Mm. Right, well, there's three of them. Anyway, let's now take a check on the latest betting for the Ever Ready Derby. Tenby remains favourite at 4-1. to one. These are Ladbrokes prices. Then Armature, also in the Princess Collard of Dollar Colours, is second best at 7 to 1. 10 to 1 Tails, well back this week from 16 to 1. He worked well yesterday. 16 to 1, another Prince Collard of Dollar runner, Commander in Chief. Then 20 to 1 Barathea, who disappointed in the Craven. 20 to 1 Placerville, who won the Field and Stakes yesterday. 25 to 1 Shaiba, trained by Michael Stout. And Blush Rambler, who's yet to return from Dubai. 33 to 1 Desert Secret and others. Well, now, the bookmaker's reaction to the Fred Darling stakes is as follows. Elizabeth Bay remains 5-2 to two favourite for the 1,000 guineas, a French filly trained by André Favre. Then it's 3-1 to one from 4-1, to one, Sir Darty. 6-1, to one, Zerirani Sidiana. 8-1, to one, Niche, on whom Lester Pickett won the Nell Gwynn stakes. 14-1, to one, Lyric Fantasy, who goes without a run. 16-1, to one, Wixen, the filly who beat Elizabeth Bay in France. And 20-1, to one, Bath. Well, Tracy Bigger has been talking to the connections of some of the also-rans in the uh, Fred Darling. What's the news? Well, John Gosden, he was very pleased with Ribbonwood. He said that it's unlikely, though, that she'll run in the guineas. He's going to have a look at the uh, French 1,000 guineas, see what that's uh, turning out like. But he said he felt uh, she, she looked as if she was a filly that needed a bit further. Oh. But uh, he's, he's ruling out the English 1,000 guineas. Uh, Roger Charles and Sakraj, he said that uh, they're going to talk to the owner in uh, Venezuela but uh, he's not going to make any decisions as yet. Daryl Holland felt that he went too soon on the filly and she got tired. But he, he said, I quote, I don't see her winning a guineas, but we'll wait and see how she came out of that race. And John Dunlop, though, Akib, he's not going to run her in the guineas. She's had an interrupted preparation, so he's going to leave that for the time being and uh, hasn't decided where she'll go next as yet. Tracy, thank you very much for that. Yeah. Let's now move on to our last race of the afternoon. It's the Peter Smith Memorial, and Her Majesty the Queen has a runner in the race. There she is with Lord Carnarvon and her runner is Spring to Action, the Sharif Dancer Colt.
Here he is, who was placed in his first run last season and is out of that good royal mare light duty. Trained by Ian Boarding, one of 12 runners for the Peter Smith Memorial, formerly the Spring Maiden Stakes, Peter O'Sullivan names. Number one is Barak, ridden by Willie Carson. Two, Cardo Prince, John Reed. Three, Hill of Dreams, Ray Cochran. Four, Master Charlie, Michael Hills. Five, One More Pound, Richard Perham. Six, Pridwell, Steve Ramont. Seven, Ranzel, who carries the second colours of Sheikh Mohammed, written by Gary Hind. Eight, St. Keen, written by Tony McGlone. Nine, Scotsman, who carries the first colours of Sheikh Mohammed, written by Michael Roberts. Ten is Her Majesty's Spring to Action, who incidentally is engaged in the Derby and Ledger, as are Scotsman, St. Keen, Hill of Dreams and Cairo Prince. Eleven is Rainbow Lake, written by Pat Edery, and twelve, Ritzy, written by Billy Nunes, and here's how they bet. And uh, Rainbow Lake is the even money preferred horse at the moment. Scotsman, 100 to 30, Spring to Action, 5 to 1. Cairo Prince, 10 to 1. St. Keen, 12 to 1 from 8. Hill of Dreams, 16. Barak, 20 to 1. And Pridwell, 25 to 1. 33 to 1 bar. And here is the even money favourite. Henry Cecil has an outstanding record in this race, although usually with Colts. Uh, not usual for him to run a filly in the Spring Maiden. And this filly looks as though she's done plenty of work and she's wearing the colours of the moment, Prince Carlet of Dollar. Tracy? She's a nice filly, isn't she? She's a uh, half-sister to a few winners. Um, she's going to be green first time out, as a lot of these are going to be, making their race course debut. But there's a, a lot of chat about her in Newmarket. She's apparently been working well and uh, I expect a big show from her. Well, the danger is obviously the cold Scotsman, and uh, this is a runner which will certainly interest Henry Cecil because this horse finished third to Armager on his only appearance at Newmarket last autumn. Um, so, obviously, Armager's supporters will be viewing his performance today carefully. Yes, uh, another horse that uh, people have been speaking a lot about. There's a few Derby runners in this race, he being one of them by Lomond. Um, he's a nice colt. He's going down there nice and relaxed. Well, there it is. Colt from Newmarket, uh, Philly from Newmarket, Colt from Lambourne, and one or two others as well. Let's join Jimmy and John. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Tracy. Well, there's number nine we'll have a look at there. And uh, what a good striking individual he is, too. He's by Lomond out of Katina, who's by Nuriev. So he's also well bred. He's had just the one run, and as Julian was saying, that was when third here at Newmarket, rather, I should say, last September in a maiden behind Armature, and that uh, was a pretty good run. But uh, if you look at him now, you can see perhaps that he wouldn't have had half the strength he's got now at that time of the, uh, of the year, because he's a, a nice individual. I know that Paul Cole sought uh, quite a lot of this uh, attractive looking horse, and it's worth to go a little bit further with him in his stride because he covers the ground well. I think he's going to like uh, this easy going here. But um, even uh, on from today, John, I think we're going to see a lot better coming from him later in the season. Going down with the favourite there, Scotsman and Rainbow Lake. Gives you a good chance to see them both in their action as they go down to the one mile, three furlong start. Michael Roberts on Scotsman. Just had the one run, a very good one, when third in a big field at Newmarket last autumn. And Rainbow Lake, who makes her first appearance. But last year, Henry Cecil won it with a coat, making his first appearance, Tappy Rouge. And this filly certainly looks as if she knows her job, Jim. Yeah, she's a nice tough colour, John, isn't she? She's by Rainbow Quest out of Rock Feast, who was by Stage Door Johnny. She's a sixth hole, in fact, and the dam was a pretty useful performer around middle distances. And uh, I do like this filly, but uh, it's a first run ever. It's the first time she's ever seen a, a race course in earnest, and uh, Pat will be uh, giving her a lovely ride. Pat's a, a great jockey for animals that are having their first run. He leaves them with a very good memory. But what a lovely filly she is. That's number 11. She'll be going into uh, the eight box. 
Rainbow Lake. There's number 10, this is a spring to action, running in the raw colours and it's great to see Her Majesty here today. The sun's uh, really starting to shine for her at the moment, but uh, let's hope that spring to action could turn in to be a very useful colt because she's been a little bit short on the uh, on the colts as late. She's had some very good fillies, but uh, she can't really come up with a classic contender for the Derby. But this one's by Sharif Dancer out of Light Duty, who was by Queen Suzar. And uh, a nice individual. I think uh, maybe he's had two runs, John, and he uh, was placed second on his first run, but he was six on the other one. And I think he's another big colt that could go on through the season. It looks as if his first run was the better of the two when second to Comanche Gold at Kempton, beaten by two lengths. He made the running uh, the next time at Newmarket in the race okay, that the uh, Scotsman was third in. And that uh, possibly didn't suit him. He seemed to run well enough when held up the first time. And I think we'll see Frankie de Tory holding him up here. Trained by Ian Balding, who's got two other runners in the race, Hill of Dreams and Master Charlie. Let's have a look at Hill of Dreams, John. As you say, one of the three runners trained by Ian, just over the hill from here. This is a very nice colt by you Shirley Heights out of Forest Flower, by Green Forest, having his first run. And in fact, his dam was a pretty useful performer herself, who won uh, a couple of races, and one of those was the Irish 1000 Guineas. So uh, he's bred in the purple, you might say. Ray Cochran in the saddle, and Ray rides a lot of work for Ian Balding, so I think he thinks quite a lot of this filly, John. Out of Forest Flower, who is very, very fast, as you say, and this uh, colt by Shirley Heights, 16 to 1 from 14 to 1, but let's have a full show. fact we'll just give you the first three in the betting rainbow lake six to five favorite just easing slightly scotsman is seven to two spring to action's gone out to five to one and it's ten to one bar the three so not a lot of money for any of the outsiders at the moment this is number eight the stable companion of the favorite this is st keen trained by henry cecil ridden by tony mcglone and this is the Sadler's Wells Colt making his first appearance on a race course. He's a half-brother to several winners, notably Carmelite House, who was a very useful performer. Nice to see uh, Tony McGlone getting some good rides for top trainers now, John, and uh, he rides quite a lot for Henry Cecil when uh, he's got more than uh, one runner in a race, and also he goes to quite a lot of the minor meetings. Henry Cecil's often run more than one in this race, and although, as far as I remember, the fancied ones always come good, uh, the second strings have run pretty well also, so I wouldn't be surprised to see St. Keen running a good race, although there's no money for him by the look of it at the moment. That's Pridwell going in, and here in the second colours of Sheikh Mohammed is number seven, Ranzel written by Gary Hind, who rides quite a lot for John Gosden, who trains this colt. This race is now named after Peter Smith. It's a memorial race to Peter. And oh, my goodness, the jockeys owe him a vote of thanks because uh, he actually really, you might say, formed the Jockeys Association. He turned it really professionally. And, uh, well, I think all the jockeys owe him a great deal of thanks. Standing nice and quiet is Ranzel. Rainbow Lake, 5-4, to four. Scotsman 7-2, to Spring to Action, 4-1, to 10-1 to one bar those, not much of a market, they're off, and let's go to Peter. And they're running, and Scotsman going up with Spring to Action, Spring to Action on the inside of Scotsman, Scotsman just the leader from Spring to Action, then Ra Rainbow Lake is third on the outside, going up then... Uh, to join Rainbow Lake is one more pound. Ritzy is the back marker at the moment with Hill of Dreams in rear and also in rear is Pridwell. And it's Scotsman in the first colours of Sheikh Mohammed, the leader, spring to action on the inside, Rainbow Lake and uh, one more pound towards the outer. Just in behind them comes St Keen as they race towards the top bend. 
and still Scotsman taking him along. Scotsman from Rainbow Lake, one more pound, Spr spring to action on the inside in the royal colours. Cairo Prince moving up on the outside. Ransell not far behind the pace also, and Saint uh, Keen on the inside, just behind Saint Keen is uh, Master Charlie. Racing now towards the home turn in this Peter Smith Memorial Maiden and still the leader, Scotsman, from Rainbow Lake on the inside of one more pound, then spring to action. Then not far behind him is Cairo Prince as they swing into the home turn. And it's uh, Sheikh Mohammed Color still, Scotsman from Rainbow Lake. Then one more pound towards the outside, spring to action, the sheepskin nose band over on the far rail. Then comes Cairo Prince, Master Charlie, Ransell making a run towards the left of the picture, but Scotsman still with the advantage, but Rainbow Lake the filly travelling very smoothly just in behind him. Master Charlie making ground over on the far side, but spring to action still holding third place. Caro Prince is making good ground. They're racing down now towards the two furlong pole, and as they do so, it's Scotsman still the leader from Rainbow Lake, though, coming, being chased along now by Pat Ettery with Caro Prince on the outside, and spring to action renewing his challenge over on the far rail, and Master Charlie coming there, and now Caro Prince has taken it up. Caro Prince has taken it up as they race towards the furlong pole from Master Charlie and Scotsman, and spring to action as Rainbow Lake fades, and St. Keen is putting in a very good run but it's Caro Prince who's well clear as they race up towards the line and Caro Prince is going to win the Peter Smith Memorial at the line Caro Prince is the winner Master Charlie is second St Keen is third four Scotsman and five spring to action were very close together Rainbow Lake faded back into uh, sixth and last in fact was Ransell and so the result first number two Caro Prince Owned by Mr. Robert Sangster, a double for him and for his trainer, Peter Chappelheim, and for John Reed, the successful rider. Second was number four, Master Charlie, owned by Mr. David R. Watson, trained by Ian Balding and written by Michael Hills. And third, number eight, St. Keen, owned by Lord Howard of Walden, trained by Henry Cecil and written by Tony McGlone, with fourth, just fourth, Number nine, Scotsman, ahead of number ten, Spring to Action. Well, a quite dramatically impressive performance by this debutant to Peter Chappelheim. Pessimistic about his three year olds, but they're better than he thinks. The long time leader, Scotsman, up front, challenged by the Queen's Colt Spring to Action on the rails. For a moment, it looked as though he'd poke through. Pat Edery now brings the favourite under pressure, Rainbow Lake. She could find nothing. And the winner, Cairo Prince, just sweeps past her and quickly goes two or three lengths clear of his field. This was a really good performance by this son of Darshan, the Tsar of the Last winner here, a horse this who's an own brother to Hieroglyphic. And the further they go, the better he goes. This is a derby entry. The ground's obviously suiting him well, but look at the way he lengthens. And... Uh, for a first-timer, this is a really good performance. He can go to Chester or one of the classic trials now with a real chance. Look back to St. Keen and the orange colours finishing really well from way, way off the pace to be third. Master Charlie it is, uh, Ian Balding's the second string, who's moved into second, so it's a bit of a reversal because Cairo Prince has won, not too much fancied. Ian Balding's second string is second and Henry Cecil's second string is third. Now... Here's where the winner comes in the centre of the course, as you can see. And uh, the rider of uh, the Queen's Colt, John Re uh, Frankie de Torre, has gone for an ambitious run up the inner spring to action. But luckily, Michael Roberts' horse, Scotsman, had drifted off the rails, so there was plenty of room for the Queen's Colt to come there, if he'd been good enough. But just as he got there and put himself in the race for the chance, the winner's rider, John Reed, said, Go! And he just changes his reins there, as you can see, shows him the whip, asks his Darshan horse, who's still a little bit green, as you can see, he's a big leggy colt, and uh, look for a moment, uh, say he might be a stargazer, but all the while, through the last furlong, he's learning something about the game of racing, and he lengthens well on this ground, and there's no doubt he's going to be a force to be reckoned with if we have the sort of wet summer that's been promised by the wet spring because this horse has gone away to win today like a racehorse, a race which has often been won by a nice horse in the past.
Yes, Paidar Sean out of a mare who won uh, five races at a round of mile in Germany. Engaged in both uh, the Derby and the Ledger and getting a 33 to 1 quote from the Derby now from 100 to 1 after this very successful first public appearance. The starting prices as follows. First, number two, Cairo Prince. 10 to 1. Second number 4, Master Charlie, 50, 5 to 1. And third number 8, St. Keen, 12 to 1. Our results. We have uh, a result here from Thirst, the 320. On the number 6, Gone Bleu, 8 to 1. Second, Wild Prospect, 7 to 1, co-favorite. Third, Wellesley Lad, 20 to 1. And fourth, the Dandy Don, 9 to 1. Air 330, first staunch friend, 5 to 1, second native mission, 13 to 2, and third ruling, 6 to 1, and 6 ran. We're back tomorrow with four races on one of my favorite racing days of the year. The feature is the Greenham Stakes, a classic trial, Inchinore and Firm Pledge both run in that. But we leave you today with the moment when Subug made up for the big disappointment of Sayadati earlier in the week for Clive Breton and Mr. Obaya. Goodbye. Our side, uh, Subu comes to tackle Sekraj now, and Ribbonwood coming there from the rear as they come to the furlong pole. Subu in the center over on the far side, Sekraj. Ribbonwood still making ground, but Subu has taken it up now as they enter the final furlong, and Subu racing up towards the line is going to win the Fred Darling as they come to the line. Subu wins it neatly at the line. Subu the winner. It's close for second between Ribbonwood, who just gets up to.